Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to our weekly episode of Cosmic Coffee. This is cup number 13 now, We're doing this for our 13th week, coming to you live from a couple of sites here in Flagstaff, Arizona, on a really beautiful uh, June morning. I'm here uh, this morning to talk with you a little bit and talk with some of our staff about our plans for eventually eventually reopening our public programs. Uh, with us here is our outreach manager, uh, Sarah Bircher. Uh, looks like Sarah is up there on the observing deck of the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. And also uh, joining us from her home here in Flagstaff, our uh, retail manager, uh, Miriam Robbins. Good morning, Miriam. Good morning. So we're, we're going to talk to you this morning a little bit about our plans for getting back into gear as we all start to uh, think about coming out of lockdown and quarantine. Um, so, but first of all, we want to give our usual uh, short uh, uh, shout out to one of our local um, coffee shops. And uh, Sarah, you were sipping something that looked just divine a little bit earlier. Yeah, so I have a, a chai tea from Bit, Bits Bagels this morning that's keeping me going. So thanks to them. Yep, we'll keep you going. And as always, do support our, our local businesses that are trying to, to open carefully and responsibly and get back on their feet as, as we... Uh, as we emerge from our quarantine. So speaking of uh, you know, emerging from quarantine, we're thinking here extensively at Lowell about how we're going to do that. We're certainly not ready to do that yet. We're watching the, the caseloads. As you probably know, uh, there's been a very sharp spike of cases in Arizona, although not so bad here in Flagstaff yet. And there's just a lot of variables that are gonna go into deciding when we can reopen in a way that's safe and responsible for our staff for our visitors, as well as for the members of our uh, community. And we wanted to share a little bit with you this morning about how our thought processes are going. So let's start with um, uh, Sarah, who is sort of in charge of the design of, of what we're thinking about doing when we are ready to start inviting visitors back to campus. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, so before I get into the, the meat of the plan of what uh, programming is going to look like when we do open back up to the public, I want to talk a bit about what the considerations were, um, kind of what the thought process was um, as we were designing this. Uh, and kind of first and foremost is that right now, uh, people people all around the state, around the world are looking for experiences that are outdoors, right? That allow them to, to spread out and enjoy gorgeous Flagstaff weather. So we're gonna try to make as much of our programming outdoors as possible. Um, we also, we need to limit the number of guests that we can allow on campus at any given time. If, if anybody's been up here on a busy Saturday night in the summer, you know that it can get pretty crowded on our campus, right? We can have 1,100 people. I mean, um, we had 1,800 during the GoTo opening and stuff can get a little crowded and that's not, that's not ideal right now. So we need to learn how to control the flow uh, of people coming in and also control the flow of people throughout our programming spaces. So we're working out how to do that. Um, we also are intending for when we do reopen to have guests be guided, guests be accompanied by one of our educators almost at all times. Uh, and we would like to do that for the safety of our, of our staff and our guests as well, just to kind of keep those people separated from each other, you know, keep as little intermingling as possible. Uh, because the way our campus is set up, uh, it's really easy to find yourself in a building you didn't intend to. I'm sure Jeff has had visitors wander into his office every once in a while. So, um, so yeah, so we, um, we intend to make these, these guided experiences, which I think a lot of museums are going to now to, to address those problems I was just talking about. Um, and so this idea of guided tours, controlling the flow, it's different for us. But, and in thinking about this, we realize that that's okay, right? We're, we're now adding a new level, a new addition to our programming, right? We are, um, we are designing these kind of private-ish tours where your educator can develop a rapport with, with a small group of people and kind of tailor your experience to your interests as they take you around our campus. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so we, we should think of, you don't say something, Jeff? No, that's, it's a, it's a, I think a good example of what, I, what we've been trying to do um, all along, which is use this unexpected reset 
as an opportunity. And, and you know, you're seeing one of those opportunities right now. You know, for quite some time, we've been thinking it would really be a good idea to ramp up our online presence. And all of us being enforced to work by Zoom, we've, we've actually done that. And now the idea is, you know, as I understand, of course, we will eventually reopen just the standard general admission programs that we had before. But we're going to start by layering on these new a premium exclusive experiences that will then continue. So what will come out of all of this is actually not the the status quo we had before, but a, a, an expanded set of options for people with different uh, desires and, and, and interest levels. Yeah, you're right. And we're, we're looking at this like an opportunity. We were given time abundant time to uh, to design a new a new layer of these these premium exclusive programs that um, that we can now offer that we would have probably never thought of it in this way before so that's um, a pretty cool opportunity for us so um, now I'd like to get into a little bit of of the details of it um, just kind of what these programs would look like so right now um, we are thinking of limiting these programs to 10 people and you as a guest would go onto our website, buy your ticket for a specific program. And that specific program would start at a time and Miriam will tell you all about how, how the flow will work when you arrive on campus and whatnot. But uh, your program would include a set, of, a set of activities, programming spaces and whatnot. So potentially if you come during the daytime, uh, we'll walk you around our, basically our entire campus. We'll take you up to the Clark Telescope uh, the Pluto telescope telling you, of course, the story and the history behind that all the way. Uh, and then you'll end up doing solar viewing um, outside of our Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. And another fun little thing that we've been talking about is uh, uh, we intend to have the shutters open anytime that we can on those uh, on those historic telescope domes whenever the weather's nice. So uh, I personally have only ever seen the Pluto shutters open a handful of times. And so uh, this is going to be really cool for people to be able to see that in the Clark all lit up uh, nicely in the daytime. So um, so we do that one because it looks cool and two because it's going to help with that airflow, right? It's going to help change out um, change out that air that you're breathing um, because that's, Miriam's going to talk more about this later, but we do want to make these safe experiences do everything we possibly can to make sure that our staff and uh, guests are safe. So Anyway, back onto, um, so yeah, you can pick from a bunch of different programs that are gonna happen, all of which are limited to, to 10 people or fewer. And uh, nighttime programs are pretty diverse. You can you know, uh, take a big two hour tour that takes you throughout the campus, right? And then also uh, you'll get a very exclusive view of the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory where you and your, uh, you and your group will just be the only ones up here. It'll be 10 people and six telescopes. Right, and the educators will guide you through that, show you what the best of what the night has to offer through some of the best telescopes in, in the world. So um, yeah, that's pretty cool. So uh, you can, yeah, you can pick from large tours um, and you can pick from smaller tours that perhaps only include just the, the Goto telescope and our, our constellations, our uh, stargazing tours as well, so that you can just experience the best of the Flagstaff night sky has to offer and kind of a, a small little chunk of time. So um, yeah, so you're gonna get no weight stargazing through some of the best telescopes in the world, which is fantastic. Yeah, and that, that no weight is pretty significant because yeah. uh, as you said, I mean, as we well know, the, the lines get quite long. Although, you, you know, well, I think one thing we noticed when we opened the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory last uh, fall is how much faster the lines did oh, move yeah. when they were long, just because the telescopes track so well and are permanently mounted. The other beautiful thing, you know, I mean, it's been a little frustrating to build this gorgeous new facility and then have to close it. Mm -hmm. But as we start to reopen, the fact that that whole building rolls off and you're you're outdoors, so we mm -hmm. can premium viewing experience, part of that predominantly outdoor experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and throughout taking care to keep the visitor flow separate from our mm -hmm. staff areas. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, I think that's the most of what I wanted to cover with that. I'm happy to entertain any questions uh, people have. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention um, for this episode of Cosmic Coffee to our viewers, if anything we're talking about brings up questions, just ask them and we'll be answering them as we go along rather than waiting to the end just so we can address any questions you might have.
Okay, well, thanks a lot, Sarah. So um, as far as what people were, will experience, we'll uh, now pass it over to uh, our visitor experience manager, Miriam, uh, who's sort of in, in charge of making sure you have this, this fabulous experience when you come to Mars Hill. So <laughs> tell us about some of the changes we're going to be making, uh, Miriam, to ensure everybody has a, a good but also a very safe and healthy time up here. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and that is absolutely it. We want people to have the best time possible, but knowing that we are in this um, pandemic that we would like to make sure our staff and our visitors are as safe as possible. So we're basing all of our protocols really on the Center for Disease Control guidelines and also um, within consultation with doctors and medical professionals in the community so that we are trying to ensure that what we're doing is really what is the highest level of safety that we can provide and also make it pleasurable and not so much of an inconvenience that um, you don't enjoy what you're doing. Um, so basically we are limiting the groups to 10 people. So the, the tours will be staggered so that a group of 10 can arrive, you know, at a time, probably come like 10 minutes before your, your tour is scheduled so that you can check in to the visitor center. Um, when you get there, We'll be um, requiring people to wear masks. Uh, the masks, um, if you don't have your own mask, you're welcome to wear your own. We do have um, these pretty big basic disposable masks that are easy to put on and um, they'll be available in children's sizes as well. Um, so you'll come in, uh, there'll be hand sanitizer. Um, when you enter, you're welcome to use the restrooms at the visitor center and then also while you're taking your tours, there's another restroom up at the um, Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. So there's opportunities for hand washing in other areas as well. But Mary. we'll basically try to get you in and then um, encourage you to go wait outside for your um, tour guide. There'll be a nice seating area where people can be physically spaced apart six feet or parties can be spaced apart six feet and you'll be greeted by your tour guide. Once you finish your wonderful experience that Sarah just talked about, we'll um, invite you to come shop at our gift shop. We are going to be limiting the amount of people in the shop to 10 at a time. So we're, again, staggering the tours. So there should be time for people to, you know, take a souvenir home. If you don't feel comfortable shopping, um, we have everything available also on our online store at the starryskyshop.com or .org, excuse me. So people will be um, definitely invited to do that. Um, the other thing that you may be interested in knowing about is the protocols that our staff is going to be taking. So um, this is very common that uh, people will be coming in and have their temperature taken. Um, people will be sent home if they have a temperature above 104, 100.4, excuse me. <laughs> and then uh, we also are encouraging our staff to do much more hand washing throughout their shift. We'll have enough people on staff so that People can take breaks and physically wash their hands. Um, we also have our staff have these fancy face guards that they can be wearing. And we will also um, be ensuring that if somebody is not feeling well in any way, shape or form, they are not obligated to come in. Um, we are generously offering um, pay leave for people who need to stay home when they're sick. Um, so, that is that is the protocol for the staff. So if they're sick, they're not allowed in in the office. Uh, we also you'll see some changes in our kind of the way we have stuff set up. We're trying to flow people so that the idea is that you are spaced apart. Um, trying to limit people's time indoors. If we are indoors, we're going to try to set up uh, situations where there's more airflow, like leaving the lobby doors open when appropriate. Um, and we'll have those um, plexiglass guards up to help. Um, protect our staff to um, at the admissions desk and in the gift shop. So those are the um, safety protocols. The one other thing that we're doing that is kind of new is um, at in the evening when our um, cleaning shift comes on, they actually have a mist that's an antibacterial mist that they'll spray in all the buildings and it leaves kind of a, a long lasting residue that carries over for about 24 hours in addition to the um, wiping and sanitizing that we'll be doing of all the high use areas like doorknobs and um, countertops and that sort of thing. 
Yeah, that's great to hear. I was actually just talking with a staff member yesterday who was asking specifically about that, you know, because we're in addition to the public, we're talking about how to make uh, it possible or, or comfortable for staff to come back to, you know, if they want to just work in their offices for a few hours for a change of pace from being locked at home and the, the regular cleaning of things like doorknobs and railings with, with the mist, I think is, is something that will go a long way to mm -hmm. help raise people's comfort level. We did have a question come in from GKC Geoscience. We'll say, hi, Kent. Um, and there's probably a question for, for uh, Miriam. Mm -hmm. and he asks, will there be signage to discourage people from coming on campus who don't have reservations? Absolutely, yes. We're working right now to create a whole um, messaging package that um, will have signage at the bottom of the hill, will have signage up in the parking lot, um, really explaining to people that you need to pre-purchase your ticket. And quite honestly, if, some, if we don't have a tour filled, someone could come up and order a ticket on their phone, even for something a couple hours later, and then go downtown, have lunch, and come back or something. So we, we certainly um, invite people to pre-purchase their tickets online beforehand. And if someone does not know about that or understand that, we have uh, we will have signage and we'll also have staff um, available to talk to people in their vehicles and explain to them what to do right. to get a tour. Um, we have a, a really great new point of sale system that'll allow us to you know, limit the amount of um, people on a tour and also have visibility to what spaces are available to help explain to people when they can come back if um, if it's not available at the moment they show up. Right, and reservation. But, and just to, to reiterate, people must pre-purchase their tickets. Um, we're not gonna be letting people into the lobby to purchase tickets. Um, uh, that said, you know, if they have a phone and they wanna do it out in the parking lot, we would um, allow that. Right, but the, the, the main point is um, all tickets for these premium experiences are ordered online. Exactly, um, and yeah. and we do, we do we right now um, just because of the situation we we are not offering general admission tickets. So people who come up expecting kind of a general admission type experience will be um, turned away if they, if they don't want to participate in one of the tours. Right, and there and there was a question that came in from uh, Nayla Irwin. Hello, Nayla, how are you? Uh, about pricing, and you know when we do reopen the general admissions you know, that would be as previously priced. We, we're, this is all still a work in progress. We haven't settled on the exact pricing for the premium experiences yet, nor have we settled on the exact date when we can open, because it's it's really gonna depend on how the, right. the current huge spike of cases goes. You know, as, as I said earlier in the show, um, it we're actually not seeing that bad of a case surge Right here in Flagstaff. In fact, in, in Coconino County for the past couple of weeks, the caseload has been going down. But of course, it's been going up very rapidly in Phoenix. And while we want to welcome uh, visitors to campus, we know we get a lot of guests from Phoenix. And, and uh, we don't think it's necessarily the wisest thing to do by our community to be you know, encouraging uh, a lot of potentially infected folks to to come up the hill. Um, I mean, I know we rely on the, the tourist revenue, but um, you know, we got we to gotta be prudent about it. Um, so let's see, any other questions? Um, so yeah, we answered the question. We haven't settled down the, the settled on the ticket cost uh, exactly yet, um, nor have we settled on the exact opening date. Um, so, and now uh, <laughs> question has come in that's just the perfect uh, segue from uh, Robert Larkin. Thank you, Robin, because you've, uh, Robert, I'm sorry. You've, uh, you've set us up perfectly here because I was just going to mention our wonderful uh, supporters and members. And, and Robert asks, will there be uh, members nights and other events for members? And we've just been discussing this, how we can say thank you to all the, the people who support us so generously. So Miriam, you could talk a little about that. Yes, so um, obviously we really appreciate our members more than ever at this time. Um, I know many of our members have been more supportive than ever in helping us get through the past couple months where we have not, you know, been open to the public. So thank you if there's any members listening because um, we, we, we really appreciate your help. Um, and, that, and that said, we, we don't want to recognize that um, when we do reopen, which again is kind of up to the virus and what's going on in, in, um, Flagstaff, 
We will be offering the first week as uh, sort of a member preview night. So I think some of you may have remembered that when we opened up the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. So we will have opportunities for members to kind of pre-book a, a tour on those nights and come in and still have that opportunity to have a small group where you can be physically distanced and come at no cost and really honestly give us some feedback too of how it's going and what you guys would like to see us, us doing with some of these um, new programming. Um, the other thing is once we really get up and running, I know not everyone can time it, so they're there that first week, uh, we will be providing uh, a significant discount to members for these higher priced tours. And that will probably carry on until, um, you know, until we even, even when we reopen with general admission. Um, we also um, are going to try to allow members to uh, have a 20% discount on the online store. So I know some people may not even be able to travel right now. Um, and if you do want to, you know, take a piece of little back to your home where you're staying, you can order um, some, some items on the store. Um, so the other thing, we, we're still talking about some other options for memberships. Um, if people, you know, depending on the level that we're at, we have to kind of work out some of the, the uh, extra perks that members will have. But generally, um, I think the, the, the free week is really what we'd like to have our, especially our local members come and enjoy some of the new tours in that area. Okay, and question came in from uh, Kelly Hicks. For those of us who have uh, season passes or memberships, I guess, will they be extended past the expiration date to cover the time you've been closed? I don't think we've decided that and we'd probably have to talk with our development team about that. Um, they're, not, they're not online at the moment, so I don't want to uh, say something at odds with what they're thinking. So I, we can certainly follow up with them and, and let you know. So we'll, we'll write your name down and get back to you on that. Um, and speaking of exclusive experiences, there's uh, there's one we didn't mention because it's so brand new. Um, uh, in fact, even newer than the Godo. You're you're up there at the Open Deck Observatory, Sarah. But on the other side of campus, we've also got an entirely new facility where we can offer a, a very exclusive experience for for small groups. So tell us a little about that. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, so thanks to generous donations uh, from from a couple of our members, we have recently installed. Uh, the Brian Dyer telescope up in the old McAllister dome. And uh, that is a 24 inch plane wave telescope. And uh, if you've seen our interactive stargazing and whatnot, you've seen the, the plane waves behind me and, and how fantastic of telescopes these are. But instead of being fitted with a camera, uh, that 24 inch telescope is going to be fitted with an eyepiece. And because that telescope is, is far enough removed from most of our campus, uh, we're going to be offering that as a very private, very exclusive experience where you and your group um, can, can book that telescope for about 45 minutes uh, and your educator will take you up there and do a special program just for you guys, including a whole bunch of different whatever's up in the sky that we can see that looks nice, as well as a, uh, a constellation laser tour. Um, so that's going to be a fantastic experience for anybody uh, who wants that. Um, I also neglected to mention earlier uh, what we are doing for telescope safety. Uh, we are especially concerned with the idea of spreading the, the virus or, or um, losing a bit of our safety when you put your eyeball somewhere and then someone else immediately comes and puts their eyeball in the exact same place. Uh, so we're taking a lot of precautions to make sure that that telescope viewing remains a safe experience and one of those precautions is we are going to require that guests do wear masks uh, when we are viewing through telescopes just to keep them from breathing on the equipment, just to keep those respiratory particles from coating all of our, all of our telescope equipment. But uh, we also are going to be putting plastic, thin plastic cases over the eyepieces. Um, and that is, um, uh, that's so that we can have a surface that's easily cleaned and we're going to use a uh, really high percentage alcohol to, to disinfect that um, so that we're not blasting our nice optics with disinfectant constantly. Um, so that, that should be a pretty safe experience and we're excited to be able to offer that for, for our guests. 
I think you mentioned to me, Sarah, you'd actually been experimenting with completely clear Petri dishes. Yes. So yeah, the, uh, the, the irony here is just it is, Yeah. <laughs> so our current plan does involve those plastic covers to be Petri dishes because Petri dishes in their manufacturing are held to a specification of being particularly clear so that you can count colonies and whatnot. But that is some fun bit of irony that we'll use Petri dishes to protect us from a virus. Um, but uh, one more opportunity that I also forgot to mention is that I mentioned all of these different tours, some including stargazing, some including um, Goto viewing historic tours. Uh, just about all of those will be available as a family oriented tour uh, where we'll be including things like science demonstrations and activities for kids. Uh, and that will be targeted specifically for our younger audience. So um, the details of that will be available on the website when those are ready to go, but um, I'm excited to offer that as well. Yeah, that should be that we definitely want to, to reach and inspire uh, the next generation of scientists and engineers. I think it's one of our highest callings. Uh, question came in that I, that I do think um, you, you guys have thought about and, and um, quite sensible question from DP. If people book a tour and then the weather goes cloudy, will it be refunded? So uh, we're actually working on uh, cloudy night options for all of our tours. I don't think we've settled on if there will be a, a price decrease or something, but we are um, expecting to go ahead with tours, weather independent. Um, so, uh, okay, so we have settled on that. Uh, tours will continue weather independent um, and there won't be decrease in price. Uh, thank you, Danielle. Uh, so that we, obviously we won't be able to offer constellation tours um, or viewing through our Godot telescopes, um, but we're instead going to expand the experience to include, include um, an in-depth tour of our Godot telescopes, because even if you can't see through these things, they are fascinating instruments. Um, so we'll take you to learn about them, um, as well as engaging people with talks about um, some of the science that goes on here and some of just facts about astronomy and, and stories of astronomy that we will do. Um, we're actually setting up a talk venue outside um, that we will use to deliver these programs, uh, these cloudy night programs. And as I, if I recall correctly, um, maybe there's a question for Miriam perhaps, regarding the masks, we're, we're requiring that people wear masks when they're in our current visitor center and for those, those proximity moments when everybody's looking through the telescope, but for generally wandering around the campus and talking with your tour guide, we are not. Is that that's correct. Yes, I mean, especially with the science showing that um, you know when there's an airflow and there's um, a nice breeze outdoors, uh, the risk is much less. So people will be allowed to remove their masks when they're you know walking and uh, just generally um, standing and listening to talks. Right, that, and that's you, you mentioned the magic word there, uh, Miriam, of course, which is science. You know, and we're we're trying to approach this scientifically. And not only for our visitors, but for staff. You know, our policy for staff is to to have people wear masks in the high traffic common areas. But if you're sitting quietly in your private office, you know, it's, it's easy enough to do the math, right? If 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 you happen to be one of the fortunate folks, and apparently there are quite a few of them who get this thing, but are just asymptomatic, but you're still shedding virus, you can look this up and see what the rates are and see what the half-life is of particles in the air and the volume of a room and just do the math and calculate risk. And that's how we've tried to approach setting our, our policies, not only for when we reopen, but how we, um, what we ask people to do um, so that we're, we're being safe. But as you said, Miriam, not going so overboard that everybody's just headachy and, and miserable and having a poor time. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, so Jeff, I do want to address um, a clarification about the cloudy night options. Um, if you as sure. a guest who's purchased a ticket uh, decide that your heart was set on looking through the telescopes and, and the clouds aren't going to allow you to do that, um, we, we will of course allow cancellations up to some predetermined point. Uh, we don't know what that point is yet, maybe it's a couple hours before, um, so that you do have the opportunity to back out if if the experience that you want won't be able to happen for whatever reason. Very good. Um, yeah, so, so as, as we're, uh, I think what we'll do, let me see if there's, um, just ask our viewers if there are any other questions. Are there any other points you would like to raise, um, uh, Sarah or Miriam, that we haven't covered yet that you, you wanted our viewers to hear about? Um, well, 
it looks like um, a good idea would be just to kind of go into a little more depth of what the tour types are, what we're planning on offering. Um, so our daytime tours are um, going to be, they're going to be kind of how we've done them in the past, and that they're more history focused, right? We've got the big blazing sun up, so we can't do a whole lot with stargazing. We will be looking at the sun. Um, but our daytime tour called the Mars Hill Tour is a uh, focuses on the history of the campus and whatnot, and uh, hits the, the Clark, the Pluto Dome, as well as the Godo. Um, at night though, things get a little more diverse. Uh, we've got some family tours going on that again include science demos and things. Um, we have something called the Expanding Universe Tour, which kind of takes the Mars Hill Tour and, and adds some stargazing and constellation tour options. So that one is our biggest, biggest one we've designed. It's two hours long, that hits the, uh, the Clark Telescope, the Pluto telescope, your no weight stargazing at the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory and finishes off with a constellation tour uh, outside the Godo up here. Um, so I'm really excited for that one. That's just, I think we've been internally calling it the kitchen sink tour because that one hits everything but the kitchen sinks of Lowell Observatory. Um, and my personal favorite, I think though, is the dark skies tour, uh, which is the one hour, you get your, your no weight stargazing at the Godo and you get that constellation tour from one of our educators. So it's just focusing on the beauty of the dark skies of Flagstaff. Um, so if you just got an hour per night and you just wanna see what, what Lowell and dark skies have to offer, that's, uh, that's gonna be the one for you. Excellent, thanks. Um, let's see, it looks like there is a question that's come in. Um, question from book 66. Oh, um, Oh yeah, yeah, there are, there are astronomy apps that you can check weather forecasts, it's more of a comment and base uh, ticket purchase on that. So, so yeah, and certainly, um, you know, I've got a couple on, on my phone and, and of course follow, we follow the weather very closely to determine what we will and won't be able to do. It's not only um, cl clear skies, but occasionally it, it can be wind too, is a factor, particularly in Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a question on um, app suggestions. Yeah, I use um, Go Skywatch uh, right here on my phone. Um, there, there's, there's the icons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Go Skywatch, and it has a, um, a companion app called Go Sat Watch, um, which is a really nice satellite tracker, and I've been using that mainly as uh, to, to watch for Starlink passes, and um, as we've been working with SpaceX to try to work on satellite brightness uh, mitigations. Um, so, so those are nice apps. Um, they, they cost a modest amount. There are also free ones like Starwalk that do uh, perfectly well. I'm, I, what do you use, uh, Sarah? Uh, for general stuff, Weather Underground um, is just, is I think the most mm -hmm. accurate of the generic one, not generic, but you know, the common ones. Um, I, I rarely have a problem with that. Um, usually I use desktop things like Clear Outside. I don't know if they have an app. Um, and uh, Noah, uh, and I usually compare about three or four different things. And when they all agree, most of the time that's what happens. And when they disagree, I kind of have to pull apart the pieces I know some are best at. But Weather Underground, I think for your one shot, and it's usually pretty accurate even a couple of days out. So that can help you with your ticket. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. And we There's do also... actually, um, we base our decisions on a, uh, a Weather Underground station that we do have on top of the Clark Telescope. So uh, one of the factors for opening up the Clark telescope is wind. And so we can measure the wind from right there. Uh, and that tells us, but that actually brings up something um, I do want to mention is that during this time when we don't have general admission and we're just doing these premium tours is that we, we don't intend to open up the Clark telescope for viewing. Um, I wanna make that, that clear. Um, we're, we're concerned about constantly disinfecting our 120, four-year-old telescope. Um, we're concerned about that, all that gorgeous refurbishing that just happened might get eaten away by alcohol or bleach or something. So uh, we wanna keep that telescope as safe as we can and we'll evaluate when it's safe to open that again, um, but not for a while. Well, and this is, this is another moment to just send out a, a massive thank you to our supporters uh, because before the Godo and before the Brian Dyer telescope, you know, if we didn't have the Clark up and running, you, you really, we, we had some portables, but you didn't have a really premium 
observing experience because the Clark is this this 24 inch refractor with just spectacular lenses. I mean, the, those those folks back in the 1890s seriously knew what they were doing when they were making telescopes. Now up at the Godo, you know, we've got um, um, a telescope with a 32 inch aperture. The Dyer is also 24. That's actually one of the neat aspects of the Dyer is the Clark and the Dyer are both 24 inch apertures and you've got an example of telescope making then and now with equivalent apertures. So we can offer these, these wonderful experiences without having the Clark available for viewing. So yes. thank you supporters because, it, you know, basically uh, four and a half million dollars of private donations yeah. that made the Dodo and the Dyer happen. It's all because of you. Yeah, and I, I want to um, accentuate too that even though we're not going to have the Clark open, uh, we do plan on having all six of our Godot telescopes running for even that small group of ten. You'll you'll cycle your way through them, um, so we don't necessarily have those on every given night, but for these premium experiences, we will. Yep. Um, and Kelly Hicks asks, is there an estimated date as to when you will be able to reopen? Um, the short answer to that question is no. I can say, I, given given the way the the caseloads are looking. I mean, it's going to be at least a month at this point. And, um, and you know, and, and anyway, we need time to really do the program design. And, and also, there's a lot of uh, retraining of staff. I mean, I know you've been doing that. You've been beginning that over the past couple of weeks, Sarah. Yeah. Um, so, but we, you know, obviously, for so many reasons, we are, we are highly motivated to reopen, you know, we we love showing people the the marvels of the cosmos, you know, and and this is this is our mission, and and we want to do our mission. Um, so so we will be reopening as soon as we can safely do so. You know, our philosophy is, um, you know, we want our, our staff and our guests to be healthy, and and health has multiple components, as I was just noting to the staff in an update the other day. You know, part of staying healthy is not getting a, a new and potentially fatal disease. Uh, part of staying healthy is living your life and, and not getting tense or, or in some cases even depressed over, over ongoing, rigorous, relentless quarantine. So, you know, when I read all of the uh, rantings online, I, I, I don't see the right answer in either extreme. You know, just quarantine until this thing passes by because it's going to be with us for a while. And you know, we're, we're at a point where we have to minimize risk and lower it to a sensible and acceptable level and, and let people live their lives and enjoy the, the good things we have to offer while taking every possible step we can to uh, prevent the spread of this thing, at least in our little corner of the world, and in particular, take care of all of our people and all of our visitors in the at-risk category. So the, you know, elderly and those with, with other conditions are you know, we everything we've been doing, uh, we've been running by our epidemiologist friends here in Flagstaff, you know, Dave Engelfaller and Paul Kime. In fact, you can scroll back, I think it was episode nine of Cosmic Coffee, where um, Dave and Paul gave me an hour of their time to discuss all of these things that we've been talking about, you know, the, the efficacy of masks, the downsides of extended quarantine. So we're trying to use professional guidance as well as mathematics and science to just do the smartest things we, we can. Um, so uh, one, one more question here from Claire Gibson. Claire asks, will operating hours be changing for these premium experiences? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Thank you, Claire. Um, so we are planning on doing what we've been threatening to do for many years uh, and extend our operating hours uh, to midnight, at least in the summertime, um, because the sun doesn't set until 8.30 or so, and it doesn't get dark enough to view uh, until just after that. So we are planning, especially for those, um, uh, remind me, the dark skies tours, right? They rely on dark skies. Um, and so we would only, if we closed at 10, like we were, would normally, uh, we would be very limited on uh, what we could do with those. So we're going to extend them till, till midnight so that we can uh, offer that opportunity for more guests. Okay, very good. Um, so let's see, any other questions? Um, I don't see any at the moment. So uh, I just wanted to mention too that um, even though we will be having the telescope viewings until midnight, um, we probably will be closing the gift shop uh, a little earlier just to um, accommodate 
staffing needs for, for that situation. So people who come to the last tours will be allowed to shop before they go on their tour. And we'll make that clear in all the, yeah. the information we give you when you get your ticket. Um, mm -hmm. So you know when your opportunities are. And you're, I saw everybody down there last week busily rearranging and redesigning mm -hmm. the whole shop area. Mm -hmm. So are you changing how people enter and exit so that the whole traffic flow is changing? Yes. Um, we, uh, I, if anyone has been to the observatory in the past, um, they'll know, you know, everyone kind of comes in and out through the visitor center, but we do have a separate outdoor entrance um, on the far side of the gift shop that will be encouraging tours to, as they're ending, to come through there. Um, they can, you know, get another spritz of hand sanitizer and um, put their masks back on and shop. And then, you know, much like you've seen in other um, retail environments, you know, we, we will have opportunities for people to be socially distanced in their, um, you know, line to check out. So we've kind of removed some of our um, displays and made the area a little bit more open to provide for, um, you know, a less cramped kind of shopping experience so that people can feel um, comfortable moving around in the store and not um, kind of on top of each other. Yeah, and of course, if you want to to order your cool Lowell swag in the ultimately distanced way, we do have this online shop that's up and running. Yeah, the starryskiesshop.org is um, definitely an opportunity for people to use if they don't want to go and interact more with people. Yep. Um, all right, well, we don't have any more questions uh, at, at, from our viewers, and I think we've covered the, the plans pretty thoroughly. Uh, we will certainly open up as soon as we possibly can and look forward to seeing everybody uh, back here on the Hill. Do want to mention, we, we've, we've uh, mentioned several times how much we benefit from our generous supporters. And once again, uh, this episode of Cosmic Coffee has been sponsored by our friends at APS. So thank you very much to APS for helping us continue to bring all of these uh, live streams. Um, so we'll say goodbye for now. Come back. Uh, if you go to our website, you'll see we have two other really cool live streams uh, scheduled for later today, including our first, uh, I, I think it's our Astronomy on Tap uh, trivia contest at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So pour yourself a nice cold beer and, and join us for some astronomy trivia. Um, and then, of course, we'll be back next week with another episode of Meet an Astronomer on Tuesday and our 14th cup of cosmic coffee. We're getting kind of jittery up here um, by, uh, um, by next Thursday. And, and tonight at nine, we will have another episode of our interactive stargazing from right up there at the Godo. So we're just, uh, we're just live streaming like crazy and we love having you join us. So we'll see you then. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay well from all of us here on Mars Hill at Lowell Observatory. Till next time, thanks a lot and goodbye. <laughs>